Although I want to give my testimony, I want it to be based on Scripture. And I want to read you a few verses from Hebrews 9 and Hebrews 10. Verse 11. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once, once for all that means, into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, mm -hmm. sanctify to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge or cleanse? I, I don't like the word purge. It's the simple word cleanse in the Greek. Purge it gives you the idea of a lot of scrubbing. Now, no, that's not the word. How much more shall the blood of Christ, cleanse, the straight general word for cleanse, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And we go over from there to chapter 10, verse 19, we can follow straight away, omitting for the moment the intervening verses, and the sentence can continue in verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness, to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from our, an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. I would like then to give you my testimony, especially as it relates to the message of revival, which has drawn so many of us together to hear more. I was saved at 18 from a non-church-going family, and I went, having left school at 18, into a London bank. I became busy in the Lord's work in interdenominational circles. I heard the gospel through an interdenominational organization. I had the idea they were the only people who knew the gospel. It never occurred to me I could hear it in churches. And as a rule, I never did. I went to a school, a boarding school, where there was compulsory chapel. There was never any gospel there, and I thought possibly that's how churches were. But of course I've learned since... <laughs> I was, that's the new convert's mistake. He thinks the only people who got it are the people who led him to Christ. But of course, how one praises God for the wide dissemination of the gospel, not wide enough, and not clearly heard in every church. But thank God for the many churches in which there is a clear gospel ministry. Well, I didn't have the benefit of that. But these circles were very rich in Christ and had much for us young Christians. And I became busy in those circles, having found the Lord myself, until the time came when the Lord called me out of that London bank to give my whole time without any other preparation or training to the work of the gospel. The leaders of the youth movement, which I joined, which had had a mighty evangelistic influence all over the country, themselves, had gone into the work of evangelism in much the same way from business to the evangelistic platform. And they were quite ready to appoint others to their staff whom they felt were likewise called. And a name that you will know over here is Alan Redpath. He and I were bosom friends. We lived in the same area and we both felt the call to go into the field of evangelism and to offer ourselves to this particular youth movement. He, from being a, a high-grade 
chartered accountant in ICI and myself a junior clerk in a London bank. Now prior to that uh, being called into the work of the Lord I had had a new meeting with God. I was closely associated with another name, with another brother whom you know well over here, Major Ian Thomas. Alan Redpath, Major Ian Thomas and myself, we all lived in the same area and we virtually came, all came out of the same stable. And we all went straight away. In Ian's case, he went from being a medical student into the work of evangelism. He came a flame of fire going through um, England. Of course, he was young, he wasn't prominent, he took small openings, but again and again, the blessing of the Lord followed his labor. So we, we sort of, so to speak, grew up together and we provoked one another to love and good works. We little knew that how all three of us would spend so much of our time later on in this great country of yours. Now, at that time, both Ian and myself and Alan came into a deep, deeper experience of the Lord and very much through apprehending the very truths that are taught so insistently in these revival crusades. The truths of, how shall I put it, identification with Christ in his death and resurrection, do you like putting it that way? or appropriating your death with Christ, the death of the self life, that Christ might live. Yes, you know. And many of you have been richly blessed, and I was. I'd been at a Bible camp, and I first became deeply aware of jealousy in my heart there. I was uh, what we called an officer, a tent officer in that camp, had charge of a bunch of boys, and so had others of my friends. And I saw some of my friends being used of God to lead boys to Christ more than I was. And I first woke up to discover jealousy in my heart. I wrestle with it, I struggle with it, but it wouldn't go. At that time, I was, one morning I was reading Galatians 2.20, largely innocent of the teaching of others along that line, and I saw that my trouble was eye trouble. I was an eye specialist. That was why I was jealous. I wanted to be the one to be used. And I saw that that day. I was reading it in the version which didn't say I am, but that I have been crucified with Christ. And uh, not I, but Christ liveth in me. And I've been reading something by Norman Grubb about faith doesn't ask for what it hasn't got, but dares to believe it has that which is promised. And in the light of that, I said, I'm not going to ask that I should be crucified. I'm going to take it as a historic fact. It has been. That that I that I've been struggling with at the cross was ended and not mended. And I saw more. And this was the life size that, life size that really helped me that Christ now was to be my life. Not merely my life was to be Christ but Christ was to be my life. And I remember at a certain fellowship meeting in which Ian Thomas, with which Ian Thomas was associated along with me and other young people. I was the chairman on that occasion and I gave from the chair a testimony along these lines. I've never heard anybody talk about these things as actually changing anything inside them. And immediately... Ian Thomas rushed up to me and says, Roy, that's exactly what I've come through to only a week or two ago. And it was on the head of that that God ultimately called me into uh, this evangelistic society working among young people. And Alan Redpath joined that society with me. He worked in one part of the country and I in another. And they were wonderful years. I went into the field of evangelism with what I called a double-barreled message. Life for the lost, life more abundant for the believer. And God blessed in a rich way and in an easy way. Without much striving on my part, people began to be saved and seek the Lord and Christians to be helped. 
And the reason why it was in an easy way was that I wasn't doing it. I was learning to hand it over to one mightier than me. And not only to ask, but to praise it was going to be so. In those days, God gave us a great spirit of faith. And we used to thank the Lord for the souls he had saved tomorrow. And our faith was found to be honoured by God. And so that was where it was quite a little revival, in a sense, in that circle of friends. Now, for myself, I went on with this work. But the time came when that experience and even the truths from which it was based died on me. I don't know quite what had happened. I know now, but at the time I didn't. But I seem to have lost the power of the Holy Spirit by which I'd been working up to then. And my work for God became a chore, more than a delight. And because I didn't feel and have, in actual fact, the uh, power of the Spirit as I'd known, I had only one recourse, and that was to go back to the old days of self-effort, which I thought had ended, to try and make up for my, by my efforts, by my more prayer and more careful preparation and my, my more violent preaching, for what was really lacking of the gentle spirit's uh, 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 presence and power. And I believe I was a difficult person to live with because a tense man always is. And you know, the nearer a big event came in which I was to participate, the more tense I became. And my <laughs> wife found me just so much more difficult. I want to tell you that in those days mercifully God didn't allow them to be overextended he cut it short in righteousness and showed me the way of deliverance but in those days that period I died a thousand deaths in the work of the evangelist I would arrive at a railway station to an inner city where I was to take an evangelistic campaign and where perhaps quite a wide circle of people were backing it to hear a loudspeaker van going down the street calling on everybody to hear me at the town hall in the campaign. And I just knew I hadn't got what it took. I really sweated away. And of course I got striving, I got praying and trying to get myself prayed up and blessed up in preparation for this great thing. And there was not the freedom, nor the power. People who hadn't heard me before were very happy, thought it was just fine. But my wife didn't so think. She sensed the lack if I didn't. But she herself had got into exactly the same state as need as I had. And you know, she, she found herself wishing ardently that no one would respond to the invitation lest she would have to counsel them. Then at that time, we learnt that a team of missionaries had come back from East Africa where we knew there had been revival for years. And they'd come back not only to have a long delayed furlough, delayed because of the war, this was back in 47, but above all, to share with us in England what God had been teaching them of revival in East Africa. And so I invited them to come to the Easter conference for which I was responsible. I would give the first message each morning and they would take all the other sessions as a team. we put down the title of this conference Revival is here for you now but you know that title which we put down began to threaten us as the time drew near because we knew nothing had happened in us my wife and I had just come back from an evangelistic campaign 
to find that uh, the severe frost had damaged the plumbing in our house and it had broken the pipes right over our fireplace and the water was flooding everywhere. And I remember my wife getting so angry, not with me, she couldn't blame me. <laughs> I would have been blamed if she could have done, of course, when you feel angry. <laughs> I suppose she was angry with God. She was. She said, do you think that God might have looked after our house when we were away on his service? <laughs> and there was sitting on the, on, the, on the floor a poor innocent kettle. Do you know what you used? You were, used the word kettle? And she gave it a mighty kick. <laughs> <laughs> and we kept that kettle for quite a time as a memento of that needy hour in which we got. And here we were drawing ever nearer and nearer to the conference where the title was Revival is here for you now. <laughs> we were anything but revived. And you know, we prayed ardently that God would revive my wife and myself first because we felt it would be most unseemly if the leaders of the conference had to admit their need and get revived in the conference. But God in his goodness didn't answer that prayer. And we went just as we were with all our needs. Well, we listened to them. These brothers, they weren't great preachers. They didn't profess to be. They just told their story and the simple Bible teaching on which everything was based. That's the simple teaching which had been God's instrument to revive his work in the midst of the years in East Africa. And may I say... That revival had been going for about uh, 17 years by that time. It continues to this day, from 1930 to today, wider, deeper than ever before, in spite of the fact that Idi Amin ruled the land for so long. And, and I think it's true to say hundreds of, hundreds of thousands disappeared. It wasn't a persecution directly against the Christians, though they came in for it. It was against anybody who, because of some educational advantages, might pose a threat to that tyrant. Mm -hmm. But the work went on. The very perils in which people, were, which people were facing made them more receptive to the gospel. And revival in East Africa isn't merely the multiplication of conversions. That's happening. But much more importantly, the quality of life among the revived, among the saints. And I've seen a quality of life that I'd hardly ever seen in England. Well, they came to tell us about it, and they came to give us their testimonies. Now, they did not tell us one story about the outwardness of revival. They could have done, they could have matched any story you liked with what they could tell. They didn't do that. They didn't want us asking for the wrong thing. They didn't want us to be crying for the moon. They wanted revival to begin in each individual in front of them. And therefore they simply told how it begun in them and the simple Bible teaching on which it was all based. Well, we listened to them and my wife didn't seem to understand it very well, neither did I. She said, you know, they're not good preachers. You can preach better than they. <laughs> but I hadn't got what they'd got. I'll tell you one thing I noticed. My first message of the day was on the epistle to the Hebrews. And when I finished a study, for instance, they were on the platform as a team behind me, I looked round and I found them weeping. As I gave that message, they saw Jesus. They were all melted on the inside. I wasn't weeping. But I'd given the message. And I said, those fellows are seeing something that I don't see. <laughs> I could give the sound of form words, but my heart wasn't being touched as theirs was. I think I mentioned to the, in that men's uh, sharing meeting the fact that uh, very early in that conference, in a prayer meeting, my wife spilled the beans. She told God in the presence of, of, of others who heard it what a failure she was and what in great state of need she was. She didn't think it was all that unusual to say that. 
Not that she'd been in the habit of admitting her needs before other people, but she was amazed at the joy of the team. Hallelujah! She's been broken. She's come to the cross. And she little knew that she'd set her feet and taken the first steps on the old revival way. Well, I had problems. Doctrinal problems. Intellectual problems. Because when they preached what they conceived to be the very heart of revival as they'd learned it, they didn't have anything to say about those themes of sanctification which I had been trying to preach for so long. They seemed to be much simpler, more elementary than what I had been working on, but which had gone dead on me. That's the point. Those very truths that had helped me so much had gone dead. I'd lost the power. I used to go back to Galatians 2.20 and Romans 6 and John 15 and try and reckon it all true again. To no purpose. So I'd try again. To no purpose. And it was in God's wisdom that they didn't seem to have much to say about that at all. Their approach was so different. The very first message I heard in which they sought to open up the revival way as they had learnt it was on Cain and Abel. Cain, the one who came to God with the fruits of his labours, the way of works. And Abel, who brought the appointed, went the appointed way for without the shedding of blood is no remission, neither then nor now. And he came with a lamb. And its blood was shed. And God had respect to that offering. But none to that other offering which represented so, so much work of his. Well, I said, I preached that actually. I would preached it as an evangelistic sermon. Here they are telling me this is the way. I couldn't see how it applied at first. Then, of course, their testimonies followed another teaching, and I had to ultimately see that I was a Cain, trying to get right with God again, trying to get the power of the Spirit again, by doing more, by trying to pray longer, preparing my messages more. And unto that offering, the Lord had not respect. But there's, I had to see there was another way. The way of the blood. And I had to see that God wanted me a Cain to repent and then come and a offer Abel's offering. That Lamb of God who has already been offered that taketh away the sin of the world. And then they gave their testament all being Cain. And so resentful at other people who seem to get blessings some other way than the way of grace, the way of the blood. And uh, so that time went on and eventually I began to see. And one of them who was counselling me, I didn't like being counselled, I was the counsellor usually. But they didn't, take, they didn't take me for granted because I was an evangelist. They said, dear brother, we appreciate all you do but we've listened to you. You seem professional. <laughs> and you seem a bit artificial in the way you try so hard to put it over they said brother we think you need to repent <laughs> I said where do I need to repent like that verse in Malachi return unto me saith the Lord and I will return to you but you say wherein shall we return I honestly didn't know wherein I needed to return I didn't know wherein I got in the way I'd certainly lost out but how I didn't know and uh, they said well we don't know where you need to repent we've hardly known you more than two days but we could make a suggestion where you might begin <laughs> and they said we noticed or, or this particular brother who was talking to me he said I noticed when you met us at the station, you had to go quickly to another house on the campus where the conference was for to make arrangements. And you said to us, get into the car, fellas, I've got to get, go across there quickly. So we got in and we talked as we went. And when we got to that other house, you had to give some instructions or something to a, a young lady there. By the way in which you spoke to her, we didn't know whether she was your secretary or your wife. We suggest you might begin there. You 
see a tense man isn't very sweet not even if the other person is his wife and later I had to see that's where I had to begin they said that's where we began revival had to begin in our homes in a relationship between husband and wife and I had to see that this tense man had been making it very difficult for his wife and I had to begin to repent there and that opened my eyes to see so many other places wherein I needed to repent and return people that were against me because they had something against me things that had happened on committees in which I'd overridden the chairman and acted contrary to what the chairman had decided because I was quite sure the decision of that committee was wrong and I had the right answer and when he heard he was so angry and I explained how right I was I thought he understood but then I found the telephone had been put down so I left it like that I said oh I know him he's that sort of person and at this particular time when God was beginning to go deeper with my wife and myself I remember her saying there's one person you've got to get right with if no other and it's that man well I said you know what he is I'm not the first person for him to have a grudge against but I couldn't get away with it and as I thought and prayed about the matter which had arisen I saw there was another way in which that could have been handled it would have been a little slower we would have gently reasoned with one another there was the way of the lamb but I had taken the way of the lion and I was so thankful to see because I knew wherein I could repent and I called him on the telephone I said brother can I come and see you what do you want to talk to me about he hadn't talked to me for a whole year after that other incident what do you want to come and see me about I, that's all. I had to do it on the telephone I said you know that incident yes brother God showed me I was wrong and I want you to forgive me and the whole tone changed and grace and love and reconciliation came over the telephone wires and I was later invited to preach at the church of which he was the secretary he took the chair and he told the people of this reconciliation that had taken place between us but that was just one incident all sorts of things but even so although I'd had my eyes open to see sin I still wasn't through into victory I wasn't still through into uh, praising the Lord I yet needed to see the blood of Jesus I can't tell you now the specific things but bit by bit I saw that in the midst of the throne there was a lamb whose powerful blood had once atoned and now it pleads before the throne and my chains fell off and my heart was free I went forth, went forth and followed him I knew the very heart of it mere repentance mere judging myself wasn't enough necessary but that doesn't give the guilty conscience peace or take away its stain I yet needed to see the blood I used to hear my friends from Africa they might be lovingly discussing a person and his spiritual state they weren't criticizing they said you know the trouble with that dear brother fellow missionary something is he's never seen the blood and I remember the story they told the illustration the game of hunt the thimble which we, we get the children sometimes to play at Christmas time you, hunt, you hide a thimble somewhere and you put the children outside the room then they've got to come down come back and as, the, as they go round you might sing a little song as they do and, go, and re sing it louder when they get near the thimble and softer when they get away as they see the thimble they sat down leaving those still standing who hadn't seen the thimble and they said dear brother when you see the thimble you'll sit down <laughs> till that you're striving still still till you do that you think well a bit more repentance might do it but you're not sure whether you come up to standard or you want to pray more or do something else like that but when you see the thimble 
you sit down. You see, the one who shed the blood, when he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down and he invites you to do the same. And work with feast. And I had to come to see, bit by bit, that I couldn't be more right with God than what the blood of Jesus made me when I called sin, sin. I could sit down. There was no need to be rushing around in order to get right. I was right. I admitted I was wrong. And that's how it is with God. When you say you're wrong, now God says you're right. You're as right with me as the blood can make you. But when you say you're right, God says you're wrong. And you usually are all this uh, self-justification. But happy the man who's learned the blessed secret of grace. Then he's broken enough to say, oh Lord, it's me that's wrong. Like that publican who beat upon his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said he went down to his house justified rather than the other. He said, oh God, I'm all wrong. It's not my wife, it's not the kids, it's me, God. And the Lord said, I've waited a long time to hear you say that. That's what I've been waiting for. But now at last you've said it and mean it. You're as right with me as that sacrifice on the altar can make you. I don't quite understand, Lord. I just told you how wrong I am. And I'm telling you, you now are as right with me as the blood can make you. These were some of the things that set me free. Until I saw that, I was a menace. I was giving only half the message. Did you know people went out of my meeting, congregations did, like whipped dogs, with their tails between their legs. I talked about sin and repentance. But I was weak on the way of release. And so God led me on. I had to go that way. I made my mistakes. And there's some people in Britain haven't forgiven me to this hour. But thank God they're, they're dying off. <laughs> there's a new generation there's a new generation that are are blissfully ignorant of some of those early mistakes I made and I wasn't the only one the bunch of us we were learning things together that was so lovely and uh, uh, there was a team all of us had been touched initially we didn't know one another except we heard that a pastor here had given a very tremendous testimony from the pulpit and another one had given a humbling one I said, hey, these fellows have been dealt with as I've been. And we were brought together by one of them into his parsonage. We spent two or three days doing nothing but opening our hearts to one another, looking deeply as we told of God's dealings with us. And God made us a team. We had still much to learn. And so it was. This was what set us free. Then the Lord showed me more bit by bit. In the midst of the throne the lamb and the one who gave that lamb was the God of all grace and I began to learn the gospel of the grace of God all over again as it applied to Christians I could see areas where I was under law areas where I was struggling in my own strength and being unable to achieve only inherited condemnation because that's the ministration of the law the ministration of the law is death and condemnation the bit that the ministration of grace gives, gives the most helpless and hopeless of us a chance that's putting it mildly <laughs> you know we can preach a message which doesn't give failing Christians a chance you've got to do this and got to do that well what if you don't manage it oh, well you should manage it it's only about three or four steps into, in, in, into the victorious life you can take those please Sometimes I'm so weak I can't take even the first. There must be a way which accommodates me as a weak Christian that puts what I need available to me on street level and having put all that we need in Jesus, he has put it all on street level. Jesus available to you as the Christian you are. Not available to you when you've improved some and gain some spiritual stature but as you are by the way that I believe is the real meaning of a text well I don't know if I'm right to say that has is perhaps handled 
a little differently from what it really means, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, if you've got a King James and the usual King James references and the alternative readings in the usual King James version, you would say it says, or, or, among you. Christ among you, the hope of glory. Now, the indwelling of Christ is spoken in of in many another place. But there, I believe, it's something else which is spoken of. He's writing to Gentiles, outside the pale, unprivileged, normally not included into the, in, in the commonwealth of Israel and its covenant. But he's telling them you are included. And this is the mystery of God for the Gentiles. Christ among you Gentiles. Christ available to you as a Gentile. Not when a Gentile has been circumcised to become a Jew, but a Gentile as a Gentile. Christ available. And you see, if you really see the epistle to the Ephesians historically, this was its main message. The mystery that was hidden before. The Old Testament doesn't speak of the Gentiles being included. That revelation was given to Paul to reveal, and especially to, he, to, to, to these things. And, and to me, it's a, it's a more comforting truth to read it that way. Christ available to me, not when I become a better Christian, but as a failure as a needy one and he's available to me as my hope of glory a flock given a hope of glory because it's in Christ and Christ is available to him on street level but not only the hope of glory the hope of revival Christ available to you and me as our hope of revival it's all in him and you don't have to climb up into heaven to bring him down or into depths to bring him up but he's available to me and you. Now, these, these, these are some of the things I said, now, 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 now this really is giving me a chance. <laughs> There's some hope for me. And I saw that revival was not a far-off thing, but something very near. Now, you've all heard the name, I imagine, you preachers of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the Welshman, who was a top medical consultant, attending the royal family, he was a Christian and his dedication went deeper than it had before and he eventually gave up his medical career to cut, become a minister. And he asked the Welsh Presbyterians to give him the hardest assignment they had. And he began his ministry in a very hard place which, and God greatly blessed. And later, he took Dr. Campbell Morgan's <coughs> church, Westminster Chapel as it's called, in the heart of London. And... Uh, he was the one who preached the longest sermons and had the biggest crowds. People say, if you preach too long, you'll lose the crowds. You never got out of his church until after half past twelve. Sixty minutes on Sunday morning, and people came from all around. He was feeding them. That was a dear, dear Martin Lord Jones. Now, he was a Welshman. And in our country, there's one thing a Welshman, if he's a Christian, can't forget, and that's the Welsh revival. And that Welsh revival dogs his steps. <laughs> because he's not seeing it and the, and the devil can sometimes accuse him well he was a great lover of revival and prayed and longed for it and though God greatly blessed his ministry perhaps it would be true to say he never really saw that for which he longed so of course when do you call the blessing of God revival and why not how big has it got to be before you call it revival there's a lot of uh, muddled thinking in, in my mind and others but anyway and I was greatly privileged. There was a little gathering called in his study where some of the spiritual leaders who had a concern for revival got together to talk about revival and what, what does it mean? What was the possibility of God giving us that in England? And Dr. Martin was in his church in this study. He was the chairman. And he led it very well. He said, well, of course, even in this room alone, there are about three or four conceptions of revival. What do we mean by it? And so on. So it was a very helpful time. John Stott was meant to be there. He was uh, detained. But others, equally eminent. There was little me. I was thrilled to bits just to be little, listening and learning. And he said, in the discussion, he said, 
I'm puzzled. He said, I've been giving a series of sermons on revival in, in, my, in, in my morning Sunday evenings. Uh, I forget how many. And I certainly heard one or two. I heard him speak, Oh, that I will rend the heavens and come down. And he described what he conceived revival to be. And he was so terrific. Faith was virtually lost in sight. You'd almost feel and see the Godhead. And of course, in the wet days of the Welsh revival, things did manifest themselves in a very spectacular way. And he gave such a picture of what revival was, the people's faith couldn't come up to it. It was beyond our reach. And he said, you know, in my prayer meeting, having preached Sunday after Sunday about revival, it wasn't until after I preached the seventh time that one person even prayed for revival in my prayer meeting. And I said, I know. I'm not surprised. I didn't say to him. I thought so. I'm not surprised. I didn't see the availability of Jesus as my hope of revival. It was something which I've got to wait for and look for. But I didn't see that blessings abound where'er he reigns. Prisoners leap to loose their chains. The weary find eternal rest and all the sons of want are blessed.